Welcome to another hybrid activity in CST8216 processor architecture. We're now going to move on to Unit 2 computer architecture. And this unit is totally a hybrid activity. In this module, we're going to analyze circuit diagrams involving embedded computing devices. Specifically, we're going to look at what's inside a central processing unit, such as the ALU, registers, memory, input-output interfaces, the control unit, and the clock. So let's begin. This lecture has a reference to the course text. And what I'd like you to do is take a look at chapter 3 the central processing unit specifically pages 21 to 24 there's other pages in this section but we'll look at those a little bit later on when we do a lab about this section in the text when we talk about embedded systems we talk about a system that has a specific design goal whether it's your cell phone or a GPS or a device in the School of Horticulture which measures temperature and humidity or something that measures speed. It is called a ASIC, an application specific integrated circuit. And it takes certain inputs, does specific calculations on them, stores things in memory, and then outputs specific control signals or data that opens valves, controls a motor, turns on lights, or in the School of Horticulture, it might turn on lamps to keep plants warm, or it might turn on the sprinkler system. Generically, if we look at a computer organization, there's three main parts. It's the CPU, the memory subsystem, and the I.O. subsystem. And this is true whether we're talking about cruise control systems in automobiles, uh, microwave as a consumer appliance, your own personal computer, or a large mainframe in a banking organization. They all have the same basic organization. Three main components, the CPU, the memory subsystem, and the I.O. subsystem. So let's look at the CPU internal organization. There's three main parts, the registers, the control unit, and the ALU. And the CPU controls the computer. And it has the following functionality. Control, data movement, data processing, and data storage. Let's look at a diagram that's taken from Chapter 3 of our text. As we stated before, the main function is CPU or control, data movement, data processing, and data storage. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. A whole heart of the system is a control unit. It controls the operation of the CPU, memory, and I.O. components based on the sequence of instructions in memory. Where do those instructions come from? Well, it's your program. Your program controls what happens within the control unit of the CPU. The control unit executes CPU instructions, which are stored in memory. In other words, your program. Instruction executes consists of three phases. Fetch, where the instruction is read from memory. Decode, where the instruction is examined and then the operands determined. And we'll understand what an operand is a little bit later on the course. And execute where the instruction is executed. So the diagram below is called a state machine. And it continually runs. It, it goes through a fetch cycle, a decode, an execute pass, depending on what is decoded. And then it comes back up to the top. And then it goes fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute. It's a finite state machine. And you'll take more about this in level four in compilers. Then we look at the ALU, and the ALU is another workhorse in the system because it manipulates or changes or combines and calculates data values. So if we take a peek inside the ALU, we'll find that it's capable of performing operations such as addition, subtraction, comparisons, shifting, and bitwise Boolean operations. The next thing we look at is data storage, and internally within the CPU, we find that registers hold values in the CPU. And each register has a unique name. 
Something that's important to our discussion in processor architecture is how memory is organized. And here we have the memory organization of an Intel machine. So whether you're using Linux or Windows on an Intel box or an AMD box, if it's not a Mac, then here's how the memory is organized. And it's very specific. And it's called Harvard architecture, where all the data has to be stored in a separate memory space from the instruction memory. In other words, if I have some instructions that want to add a couple of numbers, and those numbers are in memory, then I have to put the instructions in one memory area and the values in another. So it's not a sequential memory addressing system. Conversely, if we look at the Motorola organization, and Motorola is now owned by a company called Freescale, then we have the Princeton or the Von Neumann architecture, where in the same memory space, I can have instructions and data. And here, the function of memory is actually determined by the programmer. Conversely, in this memory organization, the Harvard architecture, the function of memory is determined by the architecture. The programmer has no control over this, but they certainly do in the Princeton or Von Neumann architecture. That's important to know. The next thing we want to look at is the order of numbers in memory. And you might have taken this in another course, but it's worthy of note. So we're going to store a couple of values in memory. And the value in question this time is hexadecimal 03E8. And that's what this dollar sign signifies is hexadecimal or base 16. So this is a base 16 number, 03E8. And what I want to do is I want to store this value in memory. And there's two ways that this can be stored in memory. And one is called the big endian and the little endian. So when we look at the Motorola processors, the high order byte is first in memory. So here we have 03E8. So we start at the lower memory address. We progress to the higher memory address, and we have 03E8. Conversely, in Little Indian, with the same value, 03E8, when we transverse from the lower to the higher value in memory, we find that these values are stored in the opposite manner. Here, it's 03E8 for Big Indian. And in Little Indian, I have to look at things backwards. I have to go from the higher memory address to the lower one, and it's 03E8. So the important thing here is you have to know whether you're using Big Indian or Little Indian. Let's look at another example. Much bigger number here. Hexadecimal one two three four five six seven eight. It's going to take four memory addresses because each memory is capable of storing a byte. So this is a 32-bit number, and in Big Indian, it's very easy to read. Its address is 50, 51, 52, 53. Then we read hexadecimal one two, hexadecimal three four, hexadecimal five six, hexadecimal seven eight. Conversely, in Little Indian, I have to go backwards in memory from the highest to the lowest to read hexadecimal 1, 2, hexadecimal 3, 4, hexadecimal 5, 6, hexadecimal 7, 8. And this really is so important when you're loading these values into those registers that I talked about before. Because you have to realize, well, am I using Little Indian or a Big Indian? And we'll find out more about that as we go along in this course. So here's our memory and input-output interface. And that's what I.O. stands for, is input-output. The computer system we're going to use has a 16-bit 
address bus from the CPU, which has the address of the next bike to read or write. You can look at walking down the street, and if you're delivering mail, then you have to know the address of the house. Either you're going to deliver a piece of mail, or if you work for uh, UPS or something, you're going to pick up a parcel. So the address bus you can think of as the address of a house. In this case, in a computer system, it's the address that contains some data. So we have a 64 kilobyte address bus that starts at 000 hex and goes up to FFFF, and that's base 16. Our data bus is only 8 bits, and you can see the data bus down here. And it's bidirectional because the data bus, you can either write data to memory or read data from memory. And that's different from the address bus because the address bus shown here comes from the CPU. And the CPU outputs this to memory and it's not bidirectional. So it only comes from the CPU. And finally, we have the control bus, so signals coming from the CPU indicate whether we want to read or write to memory or an input-output device, and we also have a clock to synchronize the operation.